So um, I'm not going to fix fan problems for you, though. I'm going to talk about something different. I'm, I'm going to talk about targets, because, hey, you can be one, too. So let's assume I have briefly access to your laptop for, say, two minutes. It's going to be fail for you. But if you reimage or reinstall your laptop <laughs> often, you're excellent at forensics. And you can disassemble and reassemble your, back to, uh, your laptop blindfolded, just like you do that with your M16, right? <laughs> well, come on, you can buy these things in pawn shops here in Berlin. I've seen it myself in Reading. Um, so you've written backdoors and rootkits yourself. How the hell would I backdoor your box? And this is what this talk is about, because as far as I know, nobody in the open uh, literature has, has done this before. So let's talk about um, backdoors in laptops. So state of the art at the moment is to place the, uh, the, the, the backdoor either in, in hardware, meaning that you have a modified keyboard, or you place it in software. This means that you basically just have uh, probably a driver in the operating system that hooks into the appropriate routines. Some people have done it for, um, have done BIOS backdoors or ACPI backdoors. There were talks at Black Hat recently, well, a couple of years ago about this. But um, there are other things that you can backdoor as well uh, that would get you access over the laptop. Namely, I mean, what about the network card? What about the graphics card? The hard drive firmware um, AMT in your laptops? And, well, is there anything else? And this is the problem. There are so many things, there are so many microcontrollers in a modern laptop these days that it's very hard to encompass them all. And this is what this talks about, but it's only going to cover one of them. And uh, maybe, maybe some of you want to cover others in, in, in the coming years. Um, so the embedded controller is a microcontroller that is in basically every PC laptop. MacBooks are an exception here. Uh, MacBooks have something called the, the SMC, the System Management Controller, um, that has a very simple reason. So the embedded controller um, in, a, in a laptop is basically a beefed up um, keyboard controller. So some of you might remember the, um, the mighty 8042 uh, that was in, in the old ATN PS2 keyboards, or that connected, sorry, that con was connected to the ATN PS2 keyboards for converting the scan matrix codes. So this is actually um, the, uh, the, the embedded controller in, in a laptop is, is the successor of that. It does some other tasks as well, though, as we will see. And in, in MacBooks, you don't have that because the, um, the keyboard is connected <laughs> through USB. Um, however, there also was a Black Hat talk recently about how you backdoor the keyboard controller for Apple keyboards, and this applies to um, Apple laptops as well. It's just that you can't do the tricks that I will describe in this talk. Um, well, except for one. Okay, so um, it's going to be an 8 or 16-bit microcontroller, and I targeted um, Renesis here for a very specific reason. Um, namely, how many of you have a ThinkPad? <laughs> I got you all. <laughs> so um, the embedded controller basically connects to all of the sensors and actuators in your laptop. So this means um, like things like a temperature sensor, um, the battery charge controller, um, the fans, the brightness control, but also the LEDs. And if you have a ThinkPad, you'll notice uh, that some of them have this little thing called ThinkLight that will become important later. Um, but at the same time, it's also responsible for the hotkeys. So if you enable VGA out, um, or if you switch the brightness up or down, that's being handled by the, um, by the embedded controller as well. Usually what it does, it 
communicate through the, to the host CPU using an LPC, a low pin count bus. But because it intercepts these hotkeys, it needs access to the raw key stream. So it'll get all of your key presses and it'll send them onwards to the host CPU. Now, so this is what a microcontroller looked like in the old days. So it had a little window with a, uh, an EPUM underneath that you'd have to hold a UV light on to erase it. Or it, maybe it would, wouldn't have any window at all. It would just be a masked ROM. But the problem is, as you all know, uh, Flash is much cheaper these days, so everything um, that was ROM in the old days is reprogrammable these days, and this is true for the embedded controllers as well. And um, this means that oftentimes uh, when you upload, sorry, when you, when you download a, an update for your, for your notebook, uh, a BIOS update, it will also include an update for the embedded controller, just like it will include a microcode update for your, uh, for your CPU. So common embedded controllers in laptops are uh, made by a company called um, e and &E. um, So these are some of the models that are popular in netbooks. I think uh, the E&E &E ones are uh, the ones I've seen in um, the Acer Aspire one, if I remember correctly. So th th they actually, th they are, they're used in a number of netbooks. And I, I, I think I remember them having, first having them seen in, in, in the Acer ones. They're 8051 based. Um, it's an 8-bit design then. And um, there's documentation available for some of them. Um, there's... ITE, which is a, a company that um, manufactures embedded controls that also includes the so-called super I.O. controller, so it merges another chip that's usually on your, on your mainboard into, into one. This is an 8052, and um, that's also an 8-bit design. Then you have Nuvoton, um, which is a CR16 core, and they also have, so they use a CR16 core, and they also have um, I think all the ones that are 8051. And Fujitsu has this MB9378, which I have, however, only seen on Fujitsu and Fujitsu Siemens laptops thus far. And then, of course, uh, the ones that this uh, talk is about, namely the Renesas ones. So the Renesas ones are based on the Hitachi H8S architecture. So all of these are clocked at 10 megahertz. And the interesting thing is, uh, they actually are running even if your laptop is off. So as long as your laptop has power of some form, they are running. So no matter whether it's some spare juice left in your battery or whether it's just connected for charging, the ThinkPad, uh, the, this embedded controller will be on because it, it, this is the thing that actually connects, that controls how your battery is being charged. And um, uh, uh, some warning for you as well, uh, hopefully you've done this already, but if you have a ThinkPad, you should go into the BIOS and check that um, the option for um, remotely flashing your BIOS and your embedded controller is turned off, because <laughs> this is not a joke, some of them have this turned on by, by default. Um, and this, of course, is a little bit problematic, although it, it can only be um, this, this procedure can, as far as I have seen as far, I, I haven't been able to do it otherwise. I've been only been able to trigger this during the boot up of the, of the laptop. So you can't trigger this at arbitrary points, only at boot up. Um, it's nice that there has been prior work on reversing these um, controllers, um, but this has all been benign. So the, the people thus far were concerned about fixing bugs. And it's also nice that um, IDA Pro has uh, support for this and that um, I forgot to type the exact name. It's the H H8300A that you need to select if you disassemble an image. So if you disassemble your, um, your ThinkPad, you will want to look, where is mine by the way, here. You will want to look underneath the um, assembly for the uh, PC card or the Express card for this little thing. So this other thing is from a picture from 
uh, an older ThinkPad, I think from a T40. So in uh, the, the X60, it's a newer uh, a version, but it's somewhat harder to reach. Um, but basically, you have to, I mean, there, there are disassembly manuals for, for ThinkPads, and you'll have to take off the whole disassembly. You have to um, pry underneath the, the assembly for the PC card uh, slot, and it, then you'll see um, this, this microchip. And actually, uh, full documentation for these is available, so you actually you can, um, you can, you can directly, um, if you dare, solder um, wires to this chip to, to dump the internal uh, flash of this if you don't trust your host CPU to do this properly for you. Um, the prior work is really advanced. When I, was, when I first saw this, I was like, wow, um, somebody really put work into this. So there are commented disassemblies available for the T43 that are source equivalent, so you can compile them. So um, somebody went to the effort of um, documenting which uh, pins and which data lines are responsible for the keyboard scan matrix, for the think light and for the LEDs and for the, for the, for the fan control. And there are people who, who patch uh, some of you have patched some of the annoyances, for instance, uh, where back when uh, IBM didn't uh, support Linux, they had uh, patches for uh, preventing your fan from going on all the time and things like that because um, the, 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 the ACPI support in, in Linux wasn't advanced or wasn't um, bug for bug compatible enough with Windows to do that. Uh, this another crazy thing that I saw recently, so somebody actually went to the effort of, uh, this is an annoyance for many ThinkPad users, swapping the function and the control key by modifying the embedded controller firmware. And um, it's actually like a, it's for 20 something models. And when you trace down this guy and talk to, uh, look, uh, to, try to, uh, to talk to him, uh, he claims he has never actually touched a Lenovo. So he has written all of this just by looking at the source equivalent, disassembling it and patching it, then distributing this to other people. So apparently he started with a friend of him having problems while being annoyed by this, and then he wrote it for one, and then it turned out to be easy, and he did it for all of the others as well. So this is a 50-byte modification in the, in the firmware controller code. And because you probably want to download this source code equivalent as well, this is uh, the URL for that, and this is like the, I, I'll show you the disassembly uh, in a bit uh, for, the, for, the, for the laptop I have here. But um, you see, like, they document uh, which wires are connected to what. And f as I said, for, this, for the CPU, you get the whole documentation. It's, I think, uh, approximately 500 uh, pages um, of specification um, that you, do, of course, do not have to read all, but uh, that's very useful as a reference to figure out what's, what's going on if you look at uh, the source code. So the back door. Um, <laughs> there was a very, um, very circum. No, let's put it differently. How many of you have heard uh, of Promise before? So Promise was a back door, uh, an alleged back door, in the 80s. So. Um, well, actually, you know, Promise, first of all, was a, a software package, and then it was claimed to be a backdoor. Um, it was um, a, a piece of software by a company um, um, called Inslaw, and Promise stood for the prosecutor's management information system. They were basically people tracking software used by many um, attorneys, um, in the, by district attorneys in the U.S., and there were lots of legal fights about the development of, like, about a future version um, of this software. And there are people who claim that it had been pirated and backdoored by um, the CIA or Mossad, and or Mossad. Some people claim it was actually backdoored by both. And then you. Uh, ask yourself, so how, how did this work, or how is it supposed to work? I mean, all of this sounds very much like a conspiracy theory to me, but nonetheless, it uh, was great inspiration for, for the backdoor that I wrote, so I want to tell you the story. So 
promise was sold together with a computer. So the software back in those days came with a computer, and this was a Prime. I'm not sure how many of you have ever um, seen or used a Prime. Those were <laughs> gorgeous little beasts, um, but they had a horrible operating system. And um, what happened allegedly was that they, uh, the, the Primes that they sold together with the software contained two additional chips. So there was a storage chip uh, called the Elbit, and this used something called ambient electricity. So apparently, I, I don't believe that the, the least bit, but it's, uh, <laughs> so, uh, it, supposedly it used uh, the, the remaining, um, um, basically, leakage from capacitors, even when your computer was off, to, to store uh, data for you. And there was a com communication chip um, which used spat spectrum modulation to modulate out the entire contents of the database and of the keyboard buffer. And this, this was called the Petri chip. <laughs> um, then I thought, like, nice try, but can't you do that without additional hardware these days? <laughs> and um, yeah, well, not spat spectrum, but you can. So. It turns out that um, in um, these embedded controllers on ThinkPads, you have approximately four kilobytes of scratch space. In other embedded controllers, it can be much larger. So um, uh, I have seen one model where you had uh, 64 kilobytes of scratch space that you could use. I was, I think, a new e, &E chip. And uh, what this allows you now is you can record the keystroke data that a user enters over the course of the day, and you can also exfiltrate it. Now you ask yourself, well, how, how do you exfiltrate it? So the first thing um, I came up with was, okay, well, it communicates with the host CPU, so I can exfiltrate it through temperature readings. Then I thought about this again, I was like, no, that's boring. But it connects to this think light, and if you think about it, <clears throat> The think light is here, right? Up. It'll start blinking in a second, hopefully. Yeah, it's up here. So you have a wire running through here. Now, uh, can you see where this goes? <laughs> you have 10 megahertz. You have a wire. <laughs> can you say antenna? So, um, there's actually two ways you can do it. So you can either play blinking lights, um, meaning that you exfiltrated this optically, or um, you can also use um, uh, something for picking up the EM um, um, emissions from this antenna, and you will be able to pick it up approximately 50 meters away if you have very thin walls, like 50 meters in Japan probably, uh, if you have concrete walls like here. Um, it's, it's going to be a little bit more tricky. But I, I was able to do this using very low-end hardware. So um, this, is, uh, this is a very easy way to, to exfiltrate data. And um, you have 20,000 uh, 20, keystrokes in, in a buffer, um, which lasted me um, for about um, a day when I was, um, when I was lazy. Um, if you actually write a novel or something like that, it'll, you'll, you'll, you'll have to, to either have more, more, more RAM, or you, can, you could also write back to the flash if, if the RAM gets tied. I haven't implemented that part. So at the moment, what I do, I just uh, write into this ring buffer, and I periodically um, um, exfiltrate the data. However, um, now you're not very close by. Um, and you're wondering, how can I exfiltrate the data? There's another alternative. There's something called the jitterbug. Um, this is an idea that was first um, uh, presented by Sean Molina and Blaze uh, at the USENIX Security a couple of uh, years ago. And this is a very interesting idea um, if you want to leak keystrokes. Basically, what you do is uh, you have a, a, a timing channel and they used uh, they they um, they, uh, they the implementation of their um, of, of their um, of their exfiltrator 
uh, the proof of concept was a bump in the wire construction where they had something be sitting between the keyboard and the computer that would alter the timings. Um, they already suggested the firmware approach, but they didn't implement it. Um, and how it works basically is um, you have a connection to a remote computer and you assume that uh, the keyboard activity is bursted, which is, it usually is a good assumption if you don't have somebody who's, who's um, navigating an interface or something. If, if somebody is, is writing commands or is writing text, bursted activity is, is a good assumption. And what you then do is you use the interpacket delays as a one-bit timing channel to exfiltrate the data. Um, so what this means is uh, you have uh, a, a quantization on the timing of the uh, of the the, the uh, of the interpacket delays, and depending on whether you want to transmit out a zero or a one, um, you you fall into two windows of shifts in the, in the quantization. Okay, I think the talk is going to be very short, but I want to show you the back door in action now before we continue. Okay, I, I don't have to do anything because it's already turned on. So this is, uh, I started this like uh, two and a half hours ago and it's uh, bursting out the um, the keystrokes in a visible way for you. So I've slowed it down by a factor of 10. Can you, can you put that up on? Okay, since so someone. Sudo switch to, no. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, so. The thing is, um, what you see here is, um, oh, okay, you don't, okay, sorry. Um, somebody suggested doing uh, the uh, brightness modulation, but I didn't get around to implementing that. You could do this as well, then you could like turn the brightness um, off. Actually, I, can, I have another feature which I probably can turn on, um, depending on how sensitive the microphone is. Um, I just have to make sure that so, as I said, you can also control the fans. <laughs> <laughs> Just have to see what. I... Oops. Uh, so, this should turn on and off in 20 second intervals now. Um, and I'll continue the talk. Um, oops. So this is on, do you hear that? And it's going off again. Twenty seconds is going on again. Hopefully by that time I'll be back to the slide we were at. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay. Oh, it's too fast. So the good thing is that um, should go on again. So uh, one, 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 one bit, one bit of warning. Um, I first thought, hey, the fan is much better for EM than uh, this stupid LED. Um, then I realized it's a motor. Um, the motor don't like being uh, turned on and off at high frequencies. <laughs> so <laughs> this is actually how I lost the fan in the T40. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if, if you try doing that, uh, like <laughs> prepare to buy a new fan. <laughs> um, but. Let's talk about uh, defense now. So, fortunately enough, um, the EC firmware is not write-only, but you can dump it as well. And what I'd like to see, or should I think it's turning on and off? Well, uh, as I said, it's, sorry, as long as it's powered, <laughs> it'll do that, right? <laughs> 
sorry. <laughs> okay, fixed. Um, so, <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is I have, I'd like to have a repository of all of the known Git versions of um, embedded control of firmware and publish that. So I've started uh, a project um, for dumping these firmwares, and uh, the first release of that is for ThinkPads only, but I'd like uh, contributions for other models as well. Um, ThinkPads at the moment are the only ones I've cared about because of, I, I have one and there's not much, m not much sense in dumping uh, the, the firmware of um, uh, the, the MacBooks because they, they have the SMSC and um, I, I don't see yet how, how a backdoor in that would, would help you. Um, but what I want to do is I'd like to see this for other models as well. And um, as I said before, there is like is, is this an ongoing path you see. So yesterday, there was the, the, the bias ACPI backdoors. You have backdoors in the embedded controllers now, probably backdoors uh, that people can place in vPro and AMT next year. But uh, there's some severe lack on the defense side. Um, so what I'd like to see is really tools for verifying the integrity of, um, of laptop firmwares. And I'd also see the vendors um, signing these firmwares and uh, the, the devices being able to verify them. Um, I'd also like to point out that, that there is a tool already that you can extend for dumping uh, firmware of other devices in uh, both desktop and, um, and laptop hardware, namely the, the, the so-called Flash ROM uh, uh, project by uh, the, the, um, the, the core boot guys. So this works great if you want to dump, for instance, the, uh, the, 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 the firmware of your NVIDIA graphics card of, or of your network card, but they could use help as well, and it would be nice to extend this to, to more modern, um, uh, modern network cards and graphic cards. But what I think is necessary as well here is a, a more fundamental discussion on the trust that is placed in, in firmware. So for instance, one of the questions which I haven't been able to answer yet was, does this work when, Tim asks this, does this work when the TPM is enabled? I don't have TPM enabled on this ThinkPad, but I think it totally would work. I haven't seen any, any reason why it would not work when the TPM is on, because the TPM doesn't have any, any way to verify the integrity of that. So, um, as we build more and more microcontrollers in all of our uh, gear, uh, there should also be a, a way to verify that the devices that you buy, or that, yeah, well, that you buy, um, actually contain known good software. So um, we all know it's, it's a hard problem to audit code in the first place, but it's, it's, it would be nice if once you have audited, you can actually make sure that all of the, the places uh, all of the pieces that you have um, uh, in, in, your, in your gear are still uh, the way they should be. And this is uh, where I'd like to end my talk half an hour short that, so that you can make it um, to the, the party. I hear that the doors are free until 12 o'clock, so if you hurry up, you can make it. But I'll take questions now. Um, how, do, how do you access the firmware memory? I mean, uh, is there any kind of bus, uh, SMS or I2C, so you can dump the firmware? For dumping the firmware, there's a, um, a protocol that works over port um, 60 and 61 hex. So there's a handshake uh, that you can perform and then you can dump. It's basically a serial communication thing between the, um, between the, uh, the host CPU and the embedded controller. So um, 
how I found out about this, uh, when you look at the, uh, the, when you download the, the files for the BIOS updates, actually I should have, I should, well, since you're not going to the party, I'll show the rest. <laughs> okay, so this is the firmware for the X60. Where is my cursor? Uh, wait, 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 wait. Have to make, sh yeah, wait. Let's just make it such that I can see the same thing that you see. Um, so uh, when you download the, um, yeah, I know, I know, it's not a problem. Um, again, for the third time, when you download um, the BIOS updates, there will be a DOS version of the BIOS updates. Um, can you turn on, okay, Max on again. And um, in this one, I'll just show you. Oh, no, it's in downloads. Firmware, ThinkPad EC. Um, X, 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 wait. X60. Um, so you will have either the CD version or you have, no, this is actually the CD version it contains the so it contains these two flash files. And this, this second flash file is the one that you're interested in. Yes, of course. Oops. So this, oops, it's too large now. Is this large enough? Okay, so there's, um, two flash files in here, and the second one contains both the BIOS and the embedded controller um, firmware. And then I have, I think there should be a little script in this directory. Uh, oops, more than one little script. Uh, oh, the, oh the, no, those are the hash files. So they're, they're hash files for different versions of the laptop. But this extracts um, basically the embedded controller firmware from the, um, from the main BIOS image. And once you have this EC flash file, you can load it into IDA and add location, oops, where's the, at location 800 hex, there's a translation table that I always, no, it's not 800 hex. Did I load the right, uh, no, it's not right, it was on the other, so, wait, there is a, a table for translating key codes that I also, uh, that I always use for locating where things are. And the um, thing to search for, I think, is this sequence. So this is the, the key lock, uh, the, the translation table. And if you go a little bit down, you'll start seeing code, hopefully, someone. Actually, I don't think I have, yeah. So this is the entry point um, for the embedded controller firmware. It's much nicer if you actually, if you have the, uh, if you have the source code equivalent thing, you can compare in a second, because it'll look like, ah, uh, it's too large. Like people actually looked, uh, and try to understand, okay, these are large tables. Wait a second, let's have a look for the first move. So um, they actually documented what various parts of the embedded controller um, uh, code were doing. And um, these are the uh, reception completion um, handlers that you want to hook um, when you when you write these factors, uh, please um, understand that I'm not going to I'm not going to show you the code for the backdoor, uh, and I'm not going to release the code for the backdoor. But I, I'd also like to make understood that if you really want to do this, it's, it's a matter of week of a weekend to write this yourself with the knowledge I've given you now. So. Um, I, I just I, I don't want to proliferate the backdoor. That's all. Um, 
Once you've done this, um, you need to correct checksums. So the the one the old um, utility for for uh, for com computing the checksums from this uh, source equivalent distribution still works, and um, the tool chain for compiling um, the, um, the the firmware. You can there's a version of the the GNU the, the GNU bin utils for this architecture, so you have a nice round trip. You can disassemble, um, correct what you want to see corrected, and then build it again. Okay, so I think that should have answered the question for you. Not not the question. So. <laughs> <laughs> I may have, like, <laughs> maybe have evaded the question as well. No. <laughs> yes, I. I <laughs> so the question was how they communicate, right? Yeah. Yeah. And for the rest, there's the manual, and there's a program called H8H8. H8, wait, H8 Flash, I think it is. And um, reading that should give you. Um, this will show you how to write, and um, by looking at the manual, you'll also figure out how to read once you have access to the so the two the two I/O ports. So that's uh, that's easy, and also you can look at the uh, at the dumper. Okay, well, just another idea for one more side channel. One of the ThinkPad manuals I read recently says that the embedded controller is connected to some sort of RFID hardware yeah. in a laptop. So uh, maybe you can store oh. something in the configuration EEPROM and read it that way. Yeah, okay. Um, talking about connections to interesting hardware. Um, so when I submitted the talk, um, I, I had the ambition, but I didn't get around to actually doing that. But um, people who have more um, knowledge of electrical engineering and also of battery charging technology might be able to figure out a way. So um, the embedded controller also has an interface for um, the charging circuitry of um, the batteries. <laughs> so there's something called SMBUS. Um, and um, there are hardware uh, sorry, there are very low-level hardware protections in place to make sure that you don't accidentally charge the battery incorrectly and that you don't cause a hazard to yourself. But the out outstanding question for me, or he for me here still is whether it's possible or whether it is impossible to actually cause damage to the battery using the embedded controller. I think it's possible. I think it, it may actually be possible to burn yourself using that research. But um, I, at the moment, I haven't had cycles to, to, to do that. OK, the intertubes want to know, uh, will this hack have influence on the latency of the ACPI calls, and could you detect the hack that way? Right. Um, well, it will add some latency. Um, but it's going to be, let's see, I need, I think I need 120 cycles at 10 megahertz. The question is, how good is he at detecting? Uh, so um, I, 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 know of these, I know of these approaches for, for hard, I've, I've heard of these approaches for detecting hardware um, key loggers as well. Um, I'm somewhat dubious whether they they really work, um, unless you only have calibrated it to your one specific device. Because um, the fact is, there will be some clock skew, so the clock will be slightly faster, slower than 10 megahertz. And I'm not sure whether like the 120 cycles that I introduce um, are sufficient uh, for 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 whoever asked that question to detect whether he's backdoored or not. And I didn't optimize it for. Uh, for it to be hidden that way. Um, I have a question. It, aren't you afraid of lawsuit uh, because of releasing uh, probably copyrighted material? I'm not releasing copyrighted material. Explain, please. The uh, flash image. 
Yes? The software is uh, regularly copyrighted. So? And I'm not distributing that. If you set up a Git repository for it? I'm just, so, okay, maybe there was a misunderstanding. What I want to distribute is I want to distribute the hashes of the known good versions. That's all. Okay, thank so, you. So, I don't think I violate any kind of copyright that way. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, can you use DMA to refresh the controller? No, or? no, no. It's um, this is a very primitive microcontroller. Um, there, there are some of them I haven't looked at though, where they claim that they have uh, that they can support shared memory configurations. I'm not. Sh I, I, I'm, I hope nobody in the PC segment has been crazy enough to to hook up a um, an embedded controller for laptop in like in a shared way to the same memory that the host CPU is using. <laughs> and <laughs> but prove me wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, one question: How much? Uh, Problems do you have patching this? Um, you said it was would be possible on LAN, or is it possible flashing it from a USB drive? Because you uh, said you will need two minutes, but if you have to disassemble the whole uh, laptop, it no, no, I don't disassemble. No, no. Okay, so um, the way it, it works is, I just um, need access. I need to be able to boot your laptop from an external drive once or I need to have access to basically to a root shell on your box for a couple of seconds only. So the two minutes comes from the fact that I have to shut down your machine, I have to boot from my own uh, external media, and I have to turn it off again. And yeah, that's it. So the, 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 uh, the scenario for this would be uh, the attack where you have a, a, a laptop with an encrypted hard drive um, that you have lying around somewhere, and um, I want to get the passphrase up for that. More questions? No. <coughs> yes? If you build a repository of the hashes, if you build a repository of the hashes, what uh, prevents me from making a backdoor and submitting a uh, hash of the backdoor to your repository? Uh, hopefully, uh, the, <laughs> I mean, you need to, if you, so you're asking a question about trust, right? So if I understood correctly, the, the question is, how do I prevent people from introducing um, malicious, uh, or for, 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 for hashes for malicious backdoors? I, I don't have an answer to that yet that wouldn't involve that people um, claim responsibility by basically signing <laughs> this. And I, I mean, it's a matter of indirection. It's, you have to, to place trust in something at a certain point of time. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's bogus. So you could, one, one solution, one possible solution would be that the, the manufacturer itself um, places those hashes there. I don't see an incentive though for them. Then he could sign them. That would be one, um, one solution in an ideal world. I don't see that happening, though. So it will more likely be a repository that activists will use um, to, to query whether their um, laptops have known good versions of firmware. And of course, in that, um, in that scenario, if you have one rogue party that introduces um, the hashes for a malicious version, yeah, then you, the, the, whole, the whole operation is screwed. That's correct. <coughs> Thank you for making that point, though. Perhaps along those lines, um, when you read the firmware from yeah. the BIOS or what have yeah. you, um, are you talking to the code running on the EMC, or are you talking to the hardware of the EMC chip itself? I mean, could you return 
the old firmware. No, no, no I, I'm not talking to the to the software implementation. I'm actually talking to the hardware. In cool. that case. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I was worried about that first as well. Uh, TPM was mentioned before. Do you think it could, do you think it should monitor uh, this firmware? Well, I mean, if it's supposed to be uh, securing um, my, my hardware against modifications, then yes, it should. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not really familiar with uh, the, the whole um, set of ideas behind TPM, but as far as I've understood, it's supposed to make the laptop trusted to some party. And if that party happens to be the end user of the laptop, then yes, of course, it should prevent this from happening. If, however, the goal is to make the laptop more secure against modifications by the end user instead of protecting the end user itself, then I can understand why this wasn't considered. Um, the, the IBM laptops support the BIOS password. Have you checked if you can flash the firmware before you enter that password? Like, for example, via, via the LAN flashing feature, or is that disabled at that point? I haven't checked, sorry. I should, though, yeah. So, any more questions? No? So, thank you and have a good night. Okay, thank you. <laughs>